to Writer to Writer. I'm your host, Kat Filer, also known as KJ Filer. My guest today is David Boyer. David writes novels and creative nonfiction. Nearly 50 of his books are in print with major publishers. He has also published oral history, travel, biographical nonfiction. He has collaborated on memoirs. He has had plays produced in the US and EU. His works have been translated into Japanese, Dutch, Italian, Hungarian, and the rights sold for films. He taught at the MA, MFA level for 16 years. During that time, writers he mentored were taken on by major literary agencies, published by major houses, appeared on New York Times top 10 bestseller list, won the International Latino Book Award and other prizes, and have become college professors. His latest book is Writing in the Age of AI, published by Northampton House Press this month. Hi, David. It's good to see you. Oh, it's great to be here. And good to see you again, Kat. It's been way too long. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand that you have three books appearing this year. Was that on purpose? Um, well, no, it just sort of uh, shook out that way. Generally, I try to try to pace at about a book a year, but things uh, kind of got ahead of me. And uh, so I'll show you what is coming out here. Uh, let's see, last month we had F-35, which was Ooh. the uh, inside story of the Lightning II. Uh, this month we have Writing in the Age of AI, which is the book that we are going to talk about here. Okay. And later... Later, uh, later in the year, we will have the Academy come out from St. Martin's Macmillan. Okay. And I'm hoping that you and I will have a chance to talk about that one a bit later. Because... I would love to do that. Yeah, I, uh, you've been requested. I'm sure that's not a surprise. Hmm. Um, you have quite the fiction following. And they, a couple of them know that I know you and have been begging. So, yeah. <laughs> that's nice to hear. Yeah. How so tell okay. Go ahead. No, tell us about your new book, Writing in the Age of AI. Well, let's see. It's, uh, uh, it stems from a request that I had to give a talk to the Irish Writers Union in Dublin. And they said, why don't you, you know, talk to us about all this uh, AI stuff that's going on in the U.S.? And I'm like, OK, well, I'll, I'll try to do that. So I went away quickly and did my research and and ran some programs and tried some things and then gave the talk. And that sort of set me thinking in that, um, in that I have a lot of material accumulated from my teaching years and from my appearances and speeches and, and workshops and, uh, you know, and uh, Asaba and the First Coast Festival and all those things that we did. And and it's time to take those and kind of stitch them together into a writing book, which I've wanted to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. So sort of combining those with uh, with the new material on AI, that's the genesis of this book. Okay. Well, that's, and it's very interesting. I have been reading that. How do you believe artificial intelligence will impact the fields of writing and literature? Well, it already is. Um, uh, it, it, I think it will impact the field of business writing and commercial writing and content production far more quickly than it will affect literature, uh, but it will get there eventually. Um, already, I'm seeing um, I'm seeing things in my feeds and uh, my Apple News and and uh, and other content providers that are so messed up. It's got to be AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm also seeing a lot of arguing among my friends about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. I have one just complete disciple and the other one is what's wrong with you? I don't think we can be friends anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so in your book, do you explore the potential benefits of AI in the writing process or do you focus more on the challenges and risks that it presents? Oh, well, um, I would say that about 80% of the book is fairly traditional writing advice, uh, concentrating on books and how to plan because I'm a big planner. I really believe in blueprinting a novel or a nonfiction book well in advance and, and, and in great detail. So, so I talk about things like uh, character 
sketches and character interactions and character matrices and uh, flow charts and uh, the flow chart especially will tend to like gobsmack people when they see one of my <laughs> flow charts it's like wow that looks like the blueprint for a uh, for a petrochemical refinery or something <laughs> but really um, analyzing the book in advance is just like having a crew I, I use this simile a lot you know, you have a crew, a work crew reports to a vacant lot, and uh, they look at each other and they say, well, what are we going to build today? Mm -hmm. No, that's not how it works. Right. They, they arrive there with the architect and the engineer. They have a complete set of blueprints. They have a complete set of material lists. They have, they have a timeline, and they have marks that they have to hit. So that's the way I like to build a book. And I find what it, what it really does is, among other great things, it removes writer's block. It completely removes it because you thought it through in advance and you know pretty much where the book is going. Now, yes, you're going to take, uh, you're going to receive gifts on the way from the unconscious and you have to be able to integrate those, but it takes away a lot of the anxiety. So I'd say 80% of the book is about that. Then the remaining 20% is, is um, tests that I ran um analyses i ran with ai trying different forms of ai in different formats and different genres and uh, and setting those forth and saying how you can use this and how maybe you better not use this yeah uh so that's kind of it's kind of an 80 20 i would say okay okay um so what advice or strategies do you offer writers navigating the integration of ai into their creative process and is there a difference between beginning and experienced writers on that oh i think and here's the difference cat um if you already know how to write and you already know the field then i think it's safe to take a few steps into that minefield and start using these tools but okay. If you don't know how to write and you're a beginner and you're trying to learn, I would I would advise people to, to stay away from them because uh, it's like being a joiner in a furniture factory. Uh, the person who puts the uh, furniture together and makes it, you know, if they already know how to do rabbit joints, they can tell whether the machine is doing a good rabbit joint or not. But if they don't know how to make rabbit joints and don't know what a good one looks like, they're lost and they're never going to employ the tool the way it's meant to be used. Yeah. Um, are there specific areas of writing or certain genre that you believe are more susceptible to AI disruption? Yeah, we do cover that uh, in quite a bit in one of the later chapters. And, and I think you're seeing that already, uh, things like uh, sports casting, business reporting, weather reporting, um, things that have set formats where where you just uh, you know slide in the facts and the machine reinterprets them and turns them into more or less readable prose. So those those things are going to go first, and they're already going. And um, I'm seeing certain places that I've already blocked because they've announced that uh, they fired all their writers and they're going mm -hmm. strictly to AI. And I think, hey, I don't need to read this. Uh, this channel or this content provider anymore. So I block yeah. them. I mean, it's, is that, do you think that's backward of me? I don't think so. I have actually uh, heard from journalists lately who are really angry about this because somehow or another, journalism is considered to be not such an art form by their employers. And so they think they can replace them with AI. Well, the news has to arrive somehow and there has to be some sort of human interaction with that news. So I think it's a very backward way of looking at that, personally. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, uh, certainly some reporters are going to find themselves turned into editors. Yeah. And that's one of the bright spots that I, that I talk about in the book, in that, um, in that as the demand for writers lessens, the demand for editors is going to increase. And again, that is... Okay. That is where you have to learn the basics and you have to learn how to do it uh, because then you can tell when the program is not doing it right and help mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm, I'm getting 10 to 15 offers a day uh, for editing jobs. Mm -hmm. And I take, I take very few of them, uh, obviously, but there's a lot of demand out there for editors. 
to be hired, you have to have a track record. Mm -hmm. Again, that favors the experienced writer over the beginner. Yeah. Okay. Your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I agree with you. The thing that concerns me is creativity and expression. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm concerned is that I don't think that AI really thinks the way we do yet. It's more of a, I don't know what, it's a parrot, not a person. So I don't, I don't see the threat, but you may look at it differently. How do you think about that? Um, in terms of the creativity? Yeah, a cre- creativity in writing. Well, I think it could imitate creativity. Now, is an imitation of creativity real creativity? Um, but if the result looks the same, it'll be enough for most people. Okay. And, and really the demand for creativity may be overstated. Uh, I may be getting myself into hot water here, but (laughs) a lot of readers do not want particularly creative material. They would like to read a mystery or a cozy or, or watch a TV show. That's kind of like all the TV shows that they've watched before. And maybe we overestimate the demand for creativity. Well, and I think that kind of goes to the difference between literature and commercial fiction. I've had a couple of authors talking to me about how, uh, like, they feel like they need to tell us that their book is not literature. There's nothing wrong with that. So what? It's still entertaining. Mm -hmm. Still Mm -hmm. wrote a story, you know, take us on a journey. So yeah, I think, I think that's an important difference right there. What about the ethical considerations that arise with AI tools? um like copyrights well there's there's two questions uh you're asking me the uh, the ethical and then you're asking me the legal so i'll pick the ethical first okay and i had a woman ask me i had a talk in bradford pennsylvania and i had a woman ask me that very question um you know is it you know why would people uh choose uh ai generated content instead of uh you know plumping for something that's uh, human generated and i i asked her um uh do you do you use um how did i put it uh do you use um commercially produced cookware oh and she said um what do you mean i said do you use commercially purchased uh commercially mechanically produced cookware uh, or do you go to potters and tinsmiths for what you use in your kitchen? And she's like, well, I use what they what they sell. <laughs> and I said, yeah, so you don't use potters and you don't use tinsmiths. She said, no. And I said, why not? Isn't it more ethical to use potters and tinsmiths? And she was sort of, oh, I think I see what you're saying there. You know, in that, um, the the commercial realities are kind of, you know, really daunting. And if something is good enough, um, there's, a, uh, there's a law in economics called Gresham's Law, which uh, states good or bad coin drives out good, meaning if something is good enough and kind of looks like the real thing, people are going to take it because it's cheaper. Okay, yeah. that's the ethical side. Um, and that's certainly not an answer to say whether it's right or not right or wrong but but it, but it is, it does address that for most people um, economics is going to trump ethics mm, yeah legally uh, the EU uh, Lenore is on the EU copyright board um, and they are wrestling with that right now but uh, currently uh, the EU will not grant copyright to AI generated content. And uh, in the U.S., uh, I think a decision was just passed this week that um, that visual materials, images produced by AI, cannot be copyrighted. Now we're not we're not quite uh, at the point that uh, text produced by AI can't be copyrighted, but I think we may be getting there. Okay. So there are definitely copyright issues. Now, when you when you resort to AI and you generate a text, you as the person who's using it have no way of knowing where that text came from. Mm-hmm. It could be copied word for word, yeah. word word for word from some 
from some other author's book. And so you're you're in violation of copyright, you're a plagiarist, uh, and you can you can blame it on the AI, but really it's your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, caution is warranted, I think. I think so. Where I personally, just in my own community, have found the most people objecting to AI being involved is in cover design. A um, couple of my friends have been finding their own style and some of their images in mid-journey. And uh, other authors have, especially indie authors, have produced a cover and there's no protection for the person where it originated. It's been changed so many times that, you know, even with plagiarism, sometimes if you if you change enough things in it, it's really hard to point that out and make a case. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we have courts for, Kat. Yeah, but just <laughs> where we are right now, and this always happens with technology, is that the law hasn't quite caught up with whatever's going on realistically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I guess it's going to be an ongoing thing, I think. So um, what are some of the key trends or developments in AI that writers should be aware of? Well, let's see. Um, I, I point to... Uh, to some of these in in the chapters in which I cover AI and some of them let's see if I can do think about a quick rehash you know hit the high points here uh, places that um, that you can really use AI I think are in uh, changing your grade level let's okay. say that you are writing um, a uh, an adult novel uh, or let, let's do a short story. Let's say you're doing an adult short story and you think, gee, uh, here's a contest uh, that uh, accepts YA stories, but mine is not a YA story. Well, you could ask uh, Claude or ChatGPT or Poe or one of the other programs to change your story to uh, ninth grade level or 11th grade level or whatever grade level you wanted. You'd want to read it carefully, but there it's taking your words. So there's no question of copyright violation or yes. plagiarism. And it's reformulating them in a simpler way that would be more accessible to a younger audience. That, I think, is a valid use of AI. And it could be useful. Again, you'd want to read it very carefully, but, um, but I think you could use it that way, yes. I think some of us are using AI and not being... Well, not identifying it as AI. For example, I will use Grammarly as just a way of bringing attention to things that I might want to look at and edit. You might, it might break the rule, but you might be doing that on purpose. So, I mean, there has to be some human interaction and decision making there. And mm -hmm. I also use Pro Writing Aid, which I find not particularly useful, except in finding where I've missed punctuation or I've made mistakes in grammar, but and as long as it's inside of a quotation, they leave it alone, but sometimes they'll suggest something and passive voice can be a good thing, but mm -hmm. they'll mark every single one. But I really hadn't thought about it until I got ready to talk to you about this. Is that AI? Yeah, it is really. Mm -hmm. And they'll mark plagiarism on that. And, but I, they're not always right about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that there is some reason to do that. At least I think that mm -hmm. it's reasonable um, sure, that's, and... a, that's a valid use of ai but i i will issue a little caveat about about the very advanced uh plotting and novel writing programs that that uh, are trying to sell themselves to young writers and beginning writers um again um Unless you know how to write already, it's very difficult to use these programs effectively. Yeah. And a problem down the road is, will these programs be supported? Uh, you learn the program, which could take you quite a long time if these are complex programs. And, uh, and then you set the book aside and four years later, you want to go back to it and the program is no longer supported. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't even open the files. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you have to relearn uh, how to use the thing all over again. So yeah, uh, I, I'd have to be convinced to use one of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the way I got started was because um, my publisher right now requires uh, a pro writing aid report 
when you submit your manuscript. And mm. I really was convinced that the report was going to talk him out of it, um, but he liked it. And I think that that was a tribute to them because what ended up happening was they looked at why I wasn't scoring as a YA. They thought I presented it as YA and then they looked at it and it's YA. It's not teen fiction. And mm -hmm. they, they were lumping everything all together and it's not the same thing at all. So, mm. yeah, I just think that that was their way of sort of weeding out people anyway. So um, how do you envision the future of writing and literature in the age of AI and what implications does it have for aspiring and beginning writers? You've already touched on this a bit, but. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if, if, if I were speaking directly to an aspiring writer, the first thing I would do is offer condolences. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's never been easy <laughs> yeah, to. No. Uh, never been easy to become a writer and never been easy to continue as a writer, as you know. And uh, it seems to be getting, the hill seems to be getting steeper and steeper. It uh, is. I'm really grateful that uh, I started writing in the 70s and I was able to begin publishing short stories and articles at a fairly, uh, I mean, I'll being, I'm not really being modest here, but I could not write well at first, but I still could get published. And and that's going to be more and more difficult, I think, for young writers who are competing not only with the experienced writers, but also now with AI. Yeah. So that's the first thing I'd offer is condolences. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, again, to master the basics. And that's really what 80% of writing in the age of AI is about, is mastering the basics, understanding how to construct a story, how to construct characters, how to use motivation, uh, how to construct dialogue, uh, scenes, um, the flow of the book, uh, the resolution of the book, uh, or short story, or play, or screenplay. So I'm, I'm, I really urge them to concentrate on the basics. And there are ways you can, you can learn that. You can attend a writing program at the university level. Uh, you can teach yourself, you can get a bunch of books and learn from those. Uh, you can do deep reading in the classics. Those are all paths that you can use to ascend the mountains. Yes, the mountain is steep, but it can still be climbed. Yeah, um, I think one of the most, well, there's been an awful lot that you've offered me over years, but one of the most um, useful, not useful, really uh, valuable things to me that you offered me was a list of books I should be reading as reference material as a beginning writer. Hmm. And one of the things that I have done with that um, is if I have a young aspiring author that I would really like to encourage, I'm not qualified to teach, but I am qualified to encourage. And I will immediately give them a list of books that they should own and be reading and my suggestion is that you back up a minute and start here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, um, yeah, which is that's this what that's one of the last chapters is an update okay. of that list, Kat. <laughs> so there's that valuable list. You at the last uh, retreat I was with that you were there. That was one of the things that we all had to sit there and write that down. Just write this down and go get them if you don't already own them. And I was so happy to say that there was only one book on that list I didn't own and hadn't read. So oh, which one? Well, um, it was on it was self-publishing, uh, editing for self. I forget self-editing or something like that. Self-editing. That's yeah. it. That's the one. Yeah, uh, Brown and King, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's uh, and a that, really good book. That and I think that came out more recently than when I was looking at things. I think one of the nicest things that anybody ever gifted me, and it was Frank Armstrong Green, our mutual friend. Uh, he gifted me uh on writing well and it was one of the most useful mo books that i have had mm -hmm. it's not an easy read because you have to be doing it for it to mean anything for you uh, absolutely other otherwise it just doesn't mean anything so yeah. yeah i don't know if you ever read the appendices in uh in writing of the age of ai but the uh, appendix f is frank armstrong green on Point of view in fiction, how to choose and how to use, which he very graciously 
gave me permission years ago to use as I saw fit. Yeah, and I should mention to listeners and readers that Frank is a mutual friend. He had um, the Bard Society. He was involved in several things in Jacksonville, and he was instrumental in my even having an interest. I, of course, wasn't worthy. And if he would take the time with you, you figured that you must, well, you almost had to repay him was the way I felt about Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So he would spend the time with you and you knew how many people were really relying on him. So when he took an interest and started encouraging me, yeah. And that's how you and I got in in Lenore. That's how I learned or met you guys. So yeah, it's been a long time. Well, you know, the years roll on, right? They do. Uh, I was just wondering about how long that's been. And it's been long enough that your daughter is an adult publishing um, doing covers now so it's <laughs> been a while <laughs> yeah she's doing covers for Macmillan and uh and works at harvard in asian studies and and uh, and they're doing very well thank you beautiful covers mm, thank you yeah so she did one for one of the night bazaars didn't she um they did uh both night bazaars and they are doing the one that's coming up uh the night bazaar london okay Okay. Yes. Uh, the you, pronouns are they now. Oh, oh, sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Not a, well. I I have to keep myself straight too. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well. Um. So, in your research, did you come across any surprising or unexpected findings regarding the intersection of AI and writing? Surprising or unexpected? Uh. Um. Well, I I sort of had to quash my own instinctual recoil from the whole concept. Um, So maybe it was um, unexpected that I did find some ways to use it. And um, and I'm not incorporating it into my actual um, novel writing. But if I'm doing something like a press release uh, or something that is not super creative like that, I may I may give Poe or Claude or uh, some of the others a try. And now I look at the result and I think, uh, okay, this is kind of kind of where we were going, but I need to fix this and this and this and this and this. And by the time I'm done, I don't know if I really saved any time or not. But uh, but it's like being given a first draft and it's always easier to do a second draft than it is to do a first draft. So, so I was kind of surprised at that. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to get yelled at. So one of my friends is so anti AI, but I have, I'm going to admit now I'm getting trouble later that I've used it for press releases because I don't have the talent for writing a press release. You Mm -hmm. would think that I would because I've done publicity, but it's not something that's intuitive for me. Um, and I was really surprised at what it came up with. I I considered it to be an outline. This oh. is what you should hit. Mm-hmm. You know, and now now you need to write it like a person, but it was, it was pretty good. And I actually um, used it to write the uh, summary of my book. And I was really surprised at what it came up with. It, it it was very good at distilling things down. It mm-hmm. didn't make it didn't sell the book for sure. Now you have to turn it into a saleable piece of work. But yeah, it was it was a good shortcut for me. Mm-hmm. So do you have any any surprising anything that we should know? Like here's a question that one of my friends has asked me. Do you think that when you use these programs, your work is being I know it's training AI, but do you think that they're taking your work or is are you more at risk for plagiarism when you're doing these things? Well, I, I don't think there's an additional risk because you you they've really got your work anyway. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my work, uh, you know, I, I gave it a little test. I said, you know, summarize this book by David Boyer without giving it the book, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it summarized it. Uh, yeah which meant it had the book already. Yeah. Uh, so um, that's going to be the subject of several trials and court actions going forward. Um, Stephen King and others have are, have brought suit um, to, to uh, 
force some some of these companies to um, compensate writers, and uh, we'll see where that goes. I mean, that's going to be a heck of a difficult thing to try to tease out who gets what and how much. Yeah. But they are uh, they already have your books if they've been published. Yeah. Well, and I wonder how much they've got if you're parking it too. I refuse to use a OneNote. I think it is. It comes with MS Word. I'll use Google Docs. I'm not sure that I'm protecting myself at all, but it turned out to be more useful in terms of sharing things. And then after a while, I started thinking, why, do, why are they giving me unlimited space over here? There has to be a trade-off somehow. So <laughs> I think yeah, you're, you're trading, trading your data for their service. That's what I was figuring. So yeah. So is there a question I have not asked that you wish that I had asked? Um, I guess, uh, I guess where to, where to find the book, uh, I guess, uh, the book, uh, writing in the age of AI is uh, available, uh, a, in any independent bookstore, which is always our first choice, right? We have to yeah. keep those bookstores open. Absolutely. Uh, second choice is the library. If you call your library and ask for the book, they will be happy to order it for you. Uh, third choice is online and Amazon and, and Kobo and uh, Barnes and Noble and everybody has writing in the age of AI and they will be more than happy to ship you a copy. Okay. Uh, it's also available as an ebook, both trade paper and as an ebook. Uh, so I had to get that little pitch in there. The ebook is really nice. I, I love a good, I love to hold a book, but Richard and I travel a lot, as you know, and I, was a hard convert <laughs> on huh. digital books mm -hmm. because I have so many signed books and on books that just mean something to me. But when you are, when, when your living quarters is a 25 square, 25 foot RV. <laughs> so when we're traveling around the country and, and I found that I would use it a, a number of ways. One would be because I just don't have the room to carry all the books that I want to carry in the other way was because I'm finding now, and this may be a bad thing, I will be reading something and I kind of zone out. <laughs> then I get something else and read that. It gives me a lot of options. So good and bad. I'm still mm -hmm. a big fan of a book you can hold. Oh, so, I think we all are. Yeah. Um, just talking to my husband about that. And he said, um, what's your most valuable possession in the house? Why? Because we're about to design and move into a tiny house. Mm -hmm. And he says, what, what has to go? And I said, sign books. And he said, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> because I have a lot of them. <laughs> and I said, if the house was on fire, that's what I would grab. So you should put a bookshelf on wheels so we can roll it out the door. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going to be, uh, it's going to be a series of very tough choices for you. Yeah, for sure. Well, I don't know. We're going to make room for the sign books. <laughs> well, to readers and listeners, as always, I will put the links below so that you can find David's books and keep abreast of his latest adventures. And also, um, I'm on a mission now. Readers, if you are reading a book and you like it, it's nice that you bought it, but it would be just wonderful if you would leave a review, please. It just takes a couple of minutes and you don't have to leave anything long. Stars all by themselves are fine. Um, and then if you do... And if you would just go the extra mile, copy and paste. Don't just put it on Amazon. Put it on BookBub and Barnes and Noble and, you know, Goodreads and everywhere. So, yeah. And I've just discovered library thing. I've been adding books to that. So, yeah. Well, that's David. Definitely, that's definitely a mitzvah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. We'll have to get together. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much for finding the time for us today. I well, appreciate it, Kat. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Bye-bye.